very quickly we have a, a few commercials before we get into the word. Number one, remember next Lord's Day, Pastor Jeff Durbin will be with us. Uh, if you're watching this live stream or if you're watching it after it has been completed, you have to let us know we only have room for so many and uh, we plan on having dinner here and serving dinner and uh, then afterwards we're going to have a time of fellowship with Jeff, some of the men if they want to and the women can come over uh, and be at my home where we will have a time of fellowship with him after our fellowship meal. Now, very quickly, some comments. Number one, I seen last week on the news, I kind of was humored by it, where the Black Lives Matter people were pushing in Chicago to remove all of the history books out of the Chicago schools because they don't teach the truth. They want to put in place their meta narrative to what they believe. They're going to change the narrative of what really happened in America's history. And I couldn't help but reflect on how close this comes to Nazism and how that they used to burn books in Germany under Hitler's reign. When you don't like the history, the way to change it is burn it. Or simply throw the books out. And they said, maybe we can go back and we can charge those people who wrote, this is literally said, who gave us those books, sold them to us, we could go back and make them pay us back for all that we paid for them. Now, this is an uneducated man who says stuff like this. This is stuff that you can't, you, you, you don't expect anybody who's above 12 years old to speak that way. But some people just aren't smarter than a fourth grader. That's true. And so, and we see that on TV because they had a program like that. It was maybe a fifth grader. Uh, but that's the problem we live in. People, you do not change the narrative of what has gone on in our history. You can't rewrite it. That's, that is literally a revisionism of history. Marxism does that. It promotes it. This is why I hate any organization that's involved with Marxist. And then I also seen that something last week. And here again, I'm listen, I'm for justice. There are things that have gone on even to this day that are unjust that need to be rectified. I have no problem with that. We want justice on the basis of God's law. We want equal justice. We want timely justice. We don't argue over that. But the way to get that justice is not the way that we've seen everything act out. But I thought it was quite unique that there was a thing that said, all lives can't matter until black lives matter, which is really a contradiction. I don't know who wrote it, but apparently have never had a course in logic. You can't say all lives matter and exclude blacks from that and say until black lives matter. Because if you do, you've separated the blacks out of the rest of the people. That's what the white supremacists were doing in the KKK and other places. The blacks aren't really like the white people. They're different. Why would you put yourself in that position? I do not understand. When you cannot think clearly for yourself, when you start making it up as you go, you get yourself in trouble. And then you begin looking foolish. And when you begin to look foolish, people who aren't that ignorant go, boy, we don't even want, you know, we just don't want to mess with this. It's very important that all lives do matter. That including black lives, and in particular, there are some issues among the blacks that need to be resolved. 
it doesn't have to deal with just police officers and problems because we know that there are whites, blacks, Hispanics being killed or shot, and it's a problem sometimes with some of the police. Fine, we'll deal with it. And it needs to be dealt with. And it needs to be dealt with timely. No rush to judgment, but we do want a true timely effort put together to rectify injustices. I don't know anybody who believes in justice would not agree to that. And so it is, those things have to be taken care of. But we do not want to put ourselves in a position that eventually everything that we do just becomes total chaos and chaotic in our society. We are a nation of laws, not lawlessness. The reason why we're a nation of laws is because when our first colonies were established, they were established on the Ten Commandments, the biblical law of God. That has to be the overriding law. That has to be the supervising principle, the scope of what ultimately has to be done with in our society to have true justice. And you're not going to be able to blend that with Marxism or any other kind of ism that is out there. We reject all oppression in society. And oppression sometimes is self-inflicted. You have to be careful. When you create your own oppression, that's not the fault of the people that have rejected you and said that's not true and that's not what we're going to do because that's not just and it's not equality among the people. When you start asking for equal results and demanding materialistic things, which Marxism is completely materialistic, now you're asking to have a legalized theft among those who have worked for what they've gotten. Privilege just not come in one color. And racism can also come from many colors. Where God's law is violated, we need justice. We need correction. We cannot tolerate injustice in any aspect of our life or society. And so, as you sit and watch these foolish things that are being propagated, you really have to begin to wonder. I, I'm excited. Listen, people, I'm serious. Somebody said they didn't believe me. I hope the public schools never open again. They actually are starting to gather together five or six homes and neighborhoods, and they're putting the children together, and they're hiring ex-teachers. Well, listen, pick your curriculum well, because when you close down all these communist-promoting schools that are operated by the state, if you get the right curriculum, you can turn out some smart children that are properly educated. That evangelistic arm of the Antichrist needs to be shut down. I've said that for years, and I've never gotten people to go along with that outside of the homeschoolers and the Christian schoolers. Everybody else says, no, I got news for you. You know why we're at where we're at? Public schools, that's what's got us here. You gave your children over to Moloch. You've sacrificed them and their mind to a non-Christian worldview, and that cannot be tolerated. Public education was not a good idea. And do you know who fought against it more than anybody else? The 
everybody would like to say, ha, the reformers did. No, they didn't. Not in this country. It was the Catholics. They said those public schools are being started in states where Protestantism reigns, and they're all for it because they've got Protestant teachers teaching in it. And we don't want to be a part of it, which is why they started so many of their own schools. But it didn't take long for us to figure out that public educational system that was brought over from Prussia and established in this country. Go back and read the history. It was not a Christian system. Well, I don't have time to preach about that today. But I had to give you the commentary. I see these things and I just cannot believe the things I see and hear. You can't change your history without ending up repeating it. History teaches us many things. It is God's providence. It is how he has moved in time and space. And it teaches us many lessons. And often we don't understand why. But it is our job to understand what we have, where we've been, where we're at now, and where we need to go in the future. And so I think it's time to stop putting your fist up in the face of God's nose and saying to him, I don't like your history, your providence, and begin liking it because judgment day is coming and his wrath is upon us. We're under judgment. We have been ever since abortion was allowed in this country. Everything since that time period has been an act of God judging, destroying, killing our nation off. And we're about to sit through the last of it if things don't change. The Church of Jesus Christ. I'll be passing out in the next few weeks Pastor Todd has worked on a, a project and we're going to adopt it for the denomination. But it basically has been brought up about the mask situation and the idea of forcing churches on how to worship and what they have to do during worship. These are violations of the word of God. We cannot allow the state to tell us what to do. And we need to be in prayer for John MacArthur and his church. Friday, the judge ruled locally that the church had every right, according to the Constitution, to gather together. There was no way to make a law to remove their constitutional rights. And then on Saturday night, with an immediate call up, probably of one of those liberal judges, an appellate court judge ruled against them. And so today, I hope enough of their people brought weapons and said, we will have church, and you will not interfere with us. People, if you're getting forced to the fact you have no liberties, if you're going to pick a place to start a war and die, the First Amendment isn't a bad place in the Constitution when it comes to our freedom of religion. Because when that's gone, everything else is gone and you've got no place to go. There's no new countries to go to. We live in very strained times. We are battling with very strong evil forces. Well, that was enough for my commercial, it was too long. Let me get to the sermon. The sermon, deals with our series called Written with the Finger of God. We are looking at the law of God as we see them summarized in those ten commandments. Yet they have many applications, and the way that the divines dealt with them was by stating what are the duties required in the commandment, and then what are the sins forbidden in the commandment to ensure that you knew exactly how to 
order your life in a lawful way, in an orderly way, with integrity and honesty to promote truth, to promote justice among our society. To build, and I've said this before, I don't want you to lose sight of this. The Ten Commandments really deal in particular with the defense of the family. Not the state, not the church, the family. It's designed to protect the family because when the family goes wrong, the church and the state will follow. It's not the church and the state that goes wrong first, it's the family. As John Calvin taught in his institutes, the piety of the Christian father in teaching his children the law of God and the word of God as it is to be applied must be in light of the fact that they go out and they are the ones who occupy positions within the state and the church. There are three basic institutions created by God. Family, which is fundamental, and out of that comes the church and the state. And though I believe that a lot of people who work for the government may have been cloned because they all sound alike, talk alike, lie alike when you go up and talk to them, I preached a sermon once on Balaam's ass. Remember, Balaam was going to attack the children of God. Remember, the angel showed up, and even the meal wouldn't go forward, the ass, the jackass, the donkey, whatever you want to call him. He could see it, and he wasn't going toward that angel. I don't know how big the angel was, but... I would say probably eight foot with a big giant sword. He's seen it. And Balaam's conspiracy against the church fell by the wayside. But remember the uniqueness of it. It's the jackass that talks to Balaam. Has anybody here ever talked to an ass before? Well, then you haven't been involved in lobbying in D.C. or in Tallahassee. There are plenty of them. But I'm telling you, you've got to understand the law of God is essential. The way that we approach the church and the way we approach the state must come from the family. And I realize there are various aspects of people that have different views about how they want to do those things. Fine, there can be variations on certain topics, but it must be anchored to the word of God in the way that God tells us to do it. And he probably doesn't give us every detail, but he lays out the principles so that we know what the right parameters are in dealing with the family and education of our children who will go out and make up both the church and the state. The state cannot and does not clone people. Believe it or not, all those people come from somebody's home. The same with our church. So when the family goes wrong, we have a guarantee that the church and the state will eventually go along with it. And that is why the family is constantly berated and attacked. 
in our country. That de Tocqueville said in his notes concerning America, the greatness of this nation is not their government. Because he came to look at the government and he was sent by France and he wrote back and basically said, the government is, when they figure out they're going to be able to write their own meal ticket, they will destroy themselves. He predicted about 30 or 40 years, I forget how long it was, just up to that time, period, he predicted the war between the states, that this country would be at a civil war event. And he was only off by six months. But the greatness of America, he said, is in its homes. home is what really matters. That includes all lives, but it includes the necessity of understanding that that home must be governed and ordered by God. And that is only done when it's based upon his word. And so we've been looking at what does the law of God say to us, how we should order our life, how should we order our home? How should we order our state as a result? And order our churches. And it demands of us to truly and justly apply the law of God equally to all. So it is, we're going on to sermon number 119. We are dealing with the question of what is forbidden in this, the ninth commandment. Now, our sermon text is Deuteronomy 9, 10 through 11. Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Shall we look to the Lord our God in prayer? Our Holy Father, we thank you and we praise you for this time that we come together to worship and to serve you, to look into your law, understand how we are to apply it, how that we have duties to perform by its command and we have responsibility to flee from the sins that would violate this law and put us at enmity with you, O God. We pray, O God, for our homes. May our homes live by your word. We pray, O God, for everyone in that home. May they live by thy word, O God. We pray, O oh God, that you will bless us, strengthen us in that word. Give us a hunger to seek after and to live by the word. We know that we can never reach perfection, but O oh God, give us through the power of the Spirit the desire to seek that high calling. Strive every day of our life. And every time that we do wrong, may we get up and determine that we will do it right, no matter what it takes. We will not live with injustice. We will not live with sin in our lives. But our goal, our duty, our responsibility is to glorify and honor you in your holiness. 
You have told us to be holy like you are holy. That means we are to be set aside from this world of sin and to live as a righteous people. People who are different from the world. Though we be in the world, we are not of this world. But we have been born into a kingdom, a nation that cannot be stopped, that will in the end conquer all things through Christ Jesus our Lord. A church made up of people who have loved you, served you, and no matter what the world has thrown at us, we have survived it, and we go forward. And sometimes it may not be pleasant. But we know one thing. We've read the end of the book. We know who wins. And we know that those who seek to punish us for our faith in you, O God, in your word, they will stand before a sovereign, holy God who will rain judgment down upon them for their wickedness. And we pray, O God, should be thy will, take them soon and bring them to judgment. But, oh God, for you to do that, we need to become a righteous and holy people. Judgment begins with the house of the Lord. I believe we're in that judgment right now. Save us, O oh God. Give us a love for each other and a desire to help one another to honor you and your Son. For we ask these things in Christ's most holy name. Now give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive that which thy word and spirit would teach us in this time. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Now we're looking, I said, at the ninth commandment, which is thou shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. This comes from Exodus 20 and 16. This is the ninth commandment. And we said that the general scope or principle Behind the ninth commandment is the sanctity of truth and honesty in human society. And we dare not forget that that is exactly what these things are driving us to do. To honor as image bearer of God, to honor him by being truth and light just as he is truth and life. To have a love for the sanctity of life. Life. All other worldviews really and truthfully center around death, not life which makes us unique as Christians. Well, <clears throat> we left off and we're coming to the fifth thing that the divine said for us to be careful that we do not participate in the sin of violating this commandment in our lives. Whether it is individually, whether it is corporately in the family or within the church, within the state, it's not matter. We are called to bear truth. And so they said the fifth thing is passing an unjust sentence. By that they simply meant 
Do not be immoral in your judging. But rather, a morally right judgment is required of us. Now, that would be true just in our daily walk, naturally, but it also applies to us when others are brought before the state, you're asked to sit in judgment of them, then judge them morally righteous. That's a hard thing to do in our court system today because man has made up laws that do not and are not consistent with the word of God. Our first duty is to judge the law before we judge an individual. Because if the law is unjust, it will be unjust in dealing with that person. If the law is just, then we have the parameters by which to examine that individual and their actions. We have a duty to morally right judgment, not what the judge tells us, but what God tells us. Now, if the judge says, look, we're going to have you go in, we're going to have you talk about this, we want a morally right justice based on the word of God, great, but they don't do that. The judge will tell you what the state has written up as the law, and that's the basis you have to judge. And the answer is, I can't judge a man with an unjust law. And that's part of the problem that we have in our society. That's why there's so many injustices. We've left the law of God as our standard, and we have adopted our own laws as if somehow we knew better than God in writing law. A better way to govern our societies. But the reality is, we do not. Proverbs 17.15 says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them are like an abomination to the Lord. He who justifies the wicked. Well, this person is evil and he's done wrong, but we have a law that he says he's not really wicked. He's not guilty of violating anything, and yet he gets away with his wickedness. You got the problem that the law of God can or the law of man can say that evil is good and good is evil. And that they bring up in the very next point. Their sixth point is, we are forbidden calling evil good and good evil. And what is good is determined, not by man. That's pure humanism. We call it anthropocentric theology, a man-made theology of life. But what is good is determined by God's law. God's law is the basis of true morality. And evil is that which transgresses God's law and in reality is evil. So we're forbidden calling good evil and evil good. Now, a part of this comes out of the aspect of also Romans chapter two, or 12, 13, excuse me, where he tells us that the God has ordained government to what? Suppress evil, suppress those who are doing evil, and praise those who are doing what? Who are doing good. 
But the problem is when government begins to function not as God ordained it, but when they begin to say evil is good and good is evil, they begin to lose our integrity for them. Now, we do not believe in revolution. We do believe in the theory of the lesser magistrate, which someone who has the authority of the sword could be our sheriff. we got a good sheriff. We could take on the whole United States and go to war with them if they are unjust. And that would be a just war with God. But what do you do when you don't have anybody who is going against the evil that is being praised? That the good is being lifted up. I mean, the evil is being lifted up and the good is being suppressed. What do you do? Well, you have to obey God and not man. That's for sure. That's a fairly easy statement. You can't mess that one up too bad. What this was called in the time of the Reformation was the right of private judgment. We do not have the authority to pick up the sword and to go to a war with government as a people. That's revolution. That's communism, Marxism, whatever you want to call it. We are not permitted by Scripture to do that. So when you don't have a lesser magistrate who says, wait a minute, I've got the power sword, and may I may not be the head of this country, nevertheless, I have the power of the sword to lead the people away from the despot. Okay. So what do you do? It's called the right of private judgment. You simply say, you cannot command me to do evil, and you cannot forbid me for doing good. Punish me as you will, I will not conform. That's the right of private judgment. And there are times in our history that we have had to perform that very thing. We see it in the early church and the martyrs. They were willing to die for Christ. They went running down the street hollering, martyr me, martyr me. But when evil came to their door, when injustice came, they said, we will not violate the law of God. We will do what God commands and we will keep ourselves from anything that is sinful. We will not transgress his law. So no matter what you say, O oh magistrate, we will never call evil good. And we will never call good evil. That is indictment against God. Even if it cost me my life. And then there are times that Lesser magistrates, God raised up. You remember what he says in his word. I built up every nation and I can destroy any of them that I want to. He's done a good job throughout history. You need to take a look through your history and start reading the hand of God in his providential history. There have been nations that have arisen and nations that have been wiped off the face of the earth. God's just. They'll never get away with this stuff. Oh, we may have to die, but look, we're going on to our reward. We will be with Christ forever. We have been given his grace, his redemption through his son, by the power of the spirit applying it to us. What do we have to fear, God or man? The Bible says, fear him not who can kill the body but can't kill the soul, but you better fear him who can kill both body and soul. And that is God alone. So it is sometimes we die for the good. 
end sometimes. God raises up godly lesser magistrates with the power of the sword and says, lead my people to victory. And if you've never been in fought into a war with a bunch of Presbyterians, if you could ever get them right with God again, we're good fighters. We got that Scotch stubbornness and that Irish temper. It didn't take long for us to start a war. But the question is, when the trumpet sounds, together for war, Will the people know the sound thereof? That's the question. You see, our pulpits have been way too quiet about reality of life. All of life is spiritual, not part of it. Church is not just one thing in life. Church is the center of all things in life. Warrior is the foundation of that in the home. Where do those kind of warriors come from that God raises up? The home. But when the home hasn't been taught right, you're not going to have that kind of redemption. Well, the Westminster Divines went on to say, in quoting Isaiah 5.23, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man? You cannot praise evil and suppress good, and you must always, always do good and suppress evil. That's our calling. And the divines wanted to make sure that we understand that. And then the, the seventh thing, the next thing they brought out was forgery was forbidden. That is, passing off that which is not the real but a fake copy of whether it's a signature or a banknote or work, a work of art, for example, any such kind of thing, knowing that it is counterfeiting. And it is intended to deceive and to steal from another. We are required to deal in the truth, in the real, and not in the fake or the sham or the fraud. That applies to a lot of principles. We see it today in our society. First thing that went through my mind was fake news. Our president has really done a great job on trying to destroy the fourth arm of government, the media, which were not elected, and try to manipulate this nation. If there's ever a war, I hope that they understand how important it is to cut off the head of the serpent and not the tail. And that's one area that needs to be dealt with. They lie, they deceit, they give us counterfeit reports. They are doing everything they can do to suppress good and to uplift evil. And they are evil. And their people are evil. In Psalm 119 and verse 69 the proud have forged a lie against me. I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. They have forged a lie. They have what? Committed forgery. They have passed something off that is not true. They have misled. They have deceived. And we, as Christians, must not be involved in forgery or deception of any kind. 
And too often that happens. I, I one time got, I, I'd never heard of a, one of those schemes, you know, there's a pyramid scheme. I've never heard of it. I never heard of it. I just never was around it. Somebody said, oh, you, got, you need to get involved in this. You can make money. You're a kid. No. <laughs> and I did. I invested a whole 20 bucks. And I said, and I'm going to make, what, five times back? I'm going to make 100. Then if I want to invest that 100, I put it back in, and it'll bring, yeah, it'll work. So I came back. This is, uh, this, I got a long time. This is about 25 years ago. And I came back, and Jack Duguay was working with me, and I told him, I said, man, I'll tell you what, they got, they got this program going you can make money from. And he looked at me and he said, pyramid scheme? And I said, what, what's a pyramid scheme? He said, did they ask you for money and promise you they'll repay it, and then if you'll take that money after you make it, you'll send it back into them? I said, yeah. That's, that's it. And he said, Ken, they're stealing. Let me show you how it works. First time I've ever seen it laid out. And I was surprised. I've heard of people skiing, but I never heard it called a pyramid scheme. It was something new completely to me. And I'd never seen one like that before. And I went back and told the guy, I said, you're doing a very deceitful thing that's violating the law of God. Well, it's Christians who are involved, and I said, then every one of them is in sin. Well, they didn't come back to church again. And, uh, you know, it was, they loved it when I preached against the government. And I remember many people were coming to our church when I was preaching against the government. Oh, everybody wanted to hear me deal with Christianity and government. And we went through about 120 sermons, I think, on government at the time. They loved it until it turned internal. And then when you started tearing up their schemes and immorality, they had enough. Forgery. You can't be involved. No deception. If you contract to do anything, it must be honest, it must be truthful, and you must perform. We've already talked about this. And then the eighth thing that the Westminster Divines told us that we are forbidden to practice in this ninth commandment, is concealing the truth through undue silence and a just cause. The word concealing meant to hide, to disguise, to veil it so that you can't see the truth. You cannot conceal the truth. And not only can you not Con or conceal it, to hide it, to not tell the truth, you cannot become an undue witness by silence, i.e., when there is a just cause and a moral judgment must be made, if you know anything or the truth of it, which often we have been, well, I don't want to get involved, you know. I know something that could maybe help on this, but then, I, then I've got to get involved in this thing, and and I don't want to put that kind of... No, that's forbidden in this commandment. I must do judgment, and I cannot remain silent. I must speak the truth. So the divines felt very important to internalize that aspect. We cannot veil the truth. We cannot hide it. We cannot disguise it. In order to allow something to go on when we know that the opposite is true. And the truth never really sees the light of day. Thus, we cannot sit in that silence by concealing it. 
we must speak the truth. Leviticus 5.1 says, If a person sins in hearing the utterance of an oath and is a witness, whether he has seen or known the matter, if he does not tell it, he bears guilt. In other words, the principle here out of Leviticus is, is if you know the truth and you conceal it, you remain silent on it, and you do not tell it, you bear the guilt. And in essence, today we would say you're participating in that sin. And you're not allowed to do that. We must always speak the truth. Nothing but the truth. You're not allowed to inflate the truth. We cannot deflate the truth. We cannot conceal the truth. We cannot remain in silence. Because if we do, we are guilty of that very sin too. We're partakers of it. Deuteronomy 13, 6 to 8 says, If your brother, the son of your mother, your son or your daughter, the wife of your bosom or your friend who is as your own soul, secretly entices you, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers, of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you or far from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. You shall not, you hear what he's saying? You shall not consent to him or listen to him. We do not entertain it. We do not entertain lies. We do not consent to it. As a matter of fact, this is the very reason I don't believe in having these quote-unquote public debates in religion or what Todd and I call dog and pony shows. Who's the most eloquent? Who's dressed the best? Who's the best looking? Well, I know I'd win that part of it. but It's a dog and pony show. Why? Because... I may be up preaching the truth, but if he's not preaching the truth, you're listening to a lie. I don't believe it. I think it's sinful. It should never be done. You want me to come and preach the truth? I'll do that anytime you want. You want me to come and play dog and pony for your show? We're not doing it. I don't have the time to play gear games. I'll never forget. I went one time when I was real young to see a debate, and actually the guy that was wrong won the debate. And I said, how can that be? He doesn't believe anything we believe. Because he simply out-debated the other person. You must be careful. And, and I don't spend a lot of time talking to you about what is wrong about a system. I give you enough to say, stay away from it, and this is why, and we move on. You know why? Because after a while, you will entice a person to begin studying it, and that becomes a danger to them. He says you shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him. Gosh, they're really beating him up up there, aren't they? And I feel sorry for the guy because, you know, he may be wrong, but they're, they're just saying he's lying. He can't, he's not an honest man. He's got no integrity. Nor shall you spare him or conceal him. Acts 5, 3 through 9 says, But Peter said, Anias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Well, it remained. That means it was yours. 
was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Hey, the money was his. He didn't have to give it all. But he said he did, when in reality he kept some back. But he could have come and said to him, hey, I want to give a portion of this to you to help out our brethren because I sold some property. What did he demand upon him to give it all? But he wanted to be seen as one who gave it all to be seen of men. And here Peter says, what you've done is not lied to men. You've lied to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And I imagine it changed their mind about uh, being dishonest in their giving. I don't know, there's always something about seeing the reality of the consequences, isn't it? They used to do all of your, your public hangings so that people could see. This is the end of all men who go down this path. Do not go down this path. And it would put the fear of God in people seeing that. Maybe we ought to bring it back and put them on TV. This week on you're in to life, now death. We've got six men who are going to be hung. That'd be great. And if you go out and do this and steal and kill somebody and murder, this is what you get for it. It might make a difference in society, I would hope. Well, he goes on to say, and the young men arose and wrapped him up, Ananias, carried him out and buried him. Now it was, out, it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. They did this in public. And an eyes lied. His wife lied. And so that would be an interesting thing, wouldn't it? We ought to do that in our church, maybe. Hey, Enro, how much money did you put in the offering basket? I would say be very careful what your answer is. Speak the truth and do not conceal it, brother. But they did back then. The power of God was demonstrated during the time of the apostles. Oh, there would be no greater demonstration of God's power if he would let us. I know I sound like James and John. You remember those two who went around calling call God down to strike people dead? And Jesus called them bonerges from the Greek meaning sons of thunder. And he told them, hey, it doesn't work that way anymore. It used to work that way, but it don't work that way anymore. Wouldn't it be great to go to Washington, D.C. and say, I want all of you congressmen and senators out here in front of this building. Those of you who want to do the work of the Lord, you step over here. The rest of you stay on the left. And then you can call fire down from heaven and just wipe them up. Look at the other ones and say, God wants business done now. I'll bet you we'd have laws passed quickly. Things would change in our country. Well, 
Unfortunately, we can't do that. But we can tell them, hey, judgment's coming. You're under judgment. You're in judgment. And the sad thing is you can't even see it. You've killed your offspring. You've destroyed your future. It's going to require people to come in in order to fill jobs from outside, and they are not going to come with a world view and understanding and history of your nation. And that what you once knew and practiced will be no more. Because you were too stupid to not follow God's law. You thought in your arrogance you knew better than God. And you called God's goodness evil. And you called man's evil good. And my friends, that's how you destroy a nation, just real quick. Oh, we've taken a few years to get there, but go back and look at it. Back into the early time period, we had humanists. We had non-Christian people when our government, when we were formed. But the nation was predominantly, about 85%, built on the word of God. They were Christians. But how quickly things turned. How quickly, even with many good things that were brought forward, was brought and planted those presuppositions that would lead us to destruction. We've seen it in our own war. We had wars. We've been to war. We have spent money on war. We have tried to be the policemen of the world. We've tried to do everything but what God told us is our job and business. And we've become the determiners of truth and of what is good and what is evil. When in reality, evil was even among us, and we would not deal with it. My friends, God's serious that we have got to live by his law, by his word. Every day of our life, it's not easy. It is really hard to be a Christian. No, I don't mean one of those people that lip it you know, you hear them, I'm a Christian. Well, hey, how come you live like a Christian on Sunday and act like Satan throughout the week? Why are your actions sinful? Why did they violate the law of God? You see, there's a contradiction in life. You can't be and you can't serve two masters. You will either serve one and hate the other, or the one that you would normally hate, you will love, and then you hate the other. You just can't have two masters. That's why we only have one wife. No man can serve two masters. And so we're very careful about it. That's just a principle of everyday life we gotta learn. Who ought to be our master? Who is it that we are to uphold in our society? It is Christ. It is Christ who is our king, not King George. It's Christ, King Jesus. He is our victor. He is our great captain of our faith. He is the one who rides the white horse to victory over his foes. And I got news for you. One day, very soon, you're going to experience a judgment that you never thought would take place. Even the evil will be surprised at how their evil has begotten even worse evil than them. And it will eat them up. And their evil that they created will kill those who created. Because it's only anarchy and radicalism of the worst kind. Why? They don't believe in anything. They're atheists. 
They're Marxist. They're materialist. They have no place for God, for Christ. These are people we detest, and they will turn on us. But some that they're going to hold dear. You know, there are some religions that are in our country that if we are defeated as Christians, and they think they're going to get along and do all those evil, wicked things they want to do, we got some real legalistic world religions in our country that if they get control, they're going to kill them too. I'd like to live long enough to see that personally, but I'll probably be killed first. But nevertheless, you think the only thing that's been banished in America is Christianity. But I got news for you. The Christians are not the enemy of America. But every other religion is. And when you get rid of us, you'll sign your own death warrant. Those who would treat you justly honestly and truthfully will be gone and evil will become the good and the good will have been suppressed and be no more. God help us that he will spare our future, our people, our children and our grandchildren from this great disaster that's going to take place because it's going to be an evil time to live. Let us pray for revival, for reformation, for a renewing of the church to preach the pure gospel of Christ instead of this partial gospel that we do not know and looks nothing like the scripture says. Shall we pray?